So the question is a mental event. The answer is a mental event. In between is consciousness, which is not a mental event. What you experienced just now, between the question and the answer, is consciousness, which is not a mental event. Although the mental event is a modified form of consciousness, has to be. Consciousness modifies itself into the experience that we call mind. But normally we think of mind as the subject of experience, which is not Vedantic at all. If you understand Vedanta, then the mind is an object of experience. Okay, so if you read the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, I believe, where Lord Krishna talks about, I am the field and I am the knower of the field. So the field is Kshetra, and the knower of the field is Kshetragya, the knower of the field. The field by itself is without form. Otherwise, you'd be able to see it. It has no form. Having no form, it has no borders. Everything that you see has a border. Every perception has a border. But something that doesn't have a border, by definition, is infinite. And what we call the human mind is a modified, finite, momentary, transient, ephemeral, ungraspable experience in that infinite, non-local mind, which is outside of space-time. So where is this experience happening right now? This experience of you seeing me, where is it happening? If you say it's happening in the eyes, then you're wrong, because your eyes are 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. By the time light enters your eyes, goes through a lens, gets inverted, crosses over, goes to the retina, which is curved. So if you're actually having the experience of seeing me in your eyes, you should see two of me about this size, upside down and curved. It's not happening there. He pointed out that it's happening here. This is 10 centimeters by 14 centimeters by 12 centimeters approximately. How does this room fit into here? Okay, how does all this, how does the Milky Way galaxy fit into here? So that's another wrong concept. Right now, what we call science is based on a philosophy called naive realism. Naive realism is very useful because we can create technology out of it. You're doing live stream, internet, all the technology everything from jet planes to intergalactic probes. So that science is very effective. But does it lead us to truth? And I think the answer is no. Naive realism, first of all, assumes that what we call matter is the ontological primitive, which means matter is the basis of everything. If matter was the basis of everything, then how do atoms, molecules, force fields, gravity produce what we call thought, or feelings, or emotions, or imagination, or intuition, or creativity, or inspiration, or transcendence? Naive realism also is based on subject-object split. I am here, everything else is over there, which is again a perceptual illusion. Naive realism is also based on the idea that the look of the world is the human look of the world only. And we call it the objective universe. But what about other species? A snake that navigates experience through infrared, or a butterfly that knows the world through ultraviolet, or a bat that experiences the echo of ultrasound. So naive realism makes assumptions that are not true, but it works for technology, and so we assume that science is the answer. 
So science, uh, your, to answer your original question, uh, especially now with AI, is a very super intelligent system that combines different languages, biological language, mathematical language, physics language, um, and now, you know, all kinds of language, uh, including musical language and art language, it combines them to create a super intelligent system, but it's not conscious. It doesn't have longing or aspiration or existential dilemmas or address subject, it has no subjective experience. Then how it appears to me, from what you're saying, there is a reality. And there is, there are the limitations of our perception of that reality. And we somehow try to fit that in, into terms that we can understand, that our mind can understand. Am I understanding this correctly? Correct. Okay. So if, if that is so, um, then what is a wiser way to live? Uh, is it that uh, I try and understand within my perceptions as best as I can, so that I lead a peaceful life? Or do I try and understand the bigger reality? Which for many people may be a very difficult journey. Right? Uh, I don't know how many would want to see infrared and ultraviolet. Those are the limits of our well, By the way, vision. we will be able to do that okay. with the AI yeah, okay. and all that. So that will not be a limitation. But here's the, the, the essential question. What is reality? Okay, and I think anyone who has even a brief understanding of the teachings of Vedanta and Kashmir Shaivism and the non-dual traditions of the world, Advaita, yeah. will uh, understand what has been said perennially, including by Adi Shankara, if you can see it, if you can touch it, if you can taste it, if you can smell it, if you can perceive it, if you can imagine it, then it's not real, okay? The only thing that is real is inconceivable and not perceivable, and it's you. That is reality. It's formless, it's fundamental, it's infinite, it's creative, it's self-evolving, it's self-creating, self-regulating, and when you say conscious living, Conscious living is without thought. It is spontaneous. Now, if you want to talk about terms used in Vedanta, you can use terms like Icha Shakti, Kriya Shakti, Ananda Shakti, Gyan Shakti, which are modified forms, again, of consciousness, but they're spontaneous. So conscious living is spontaneous living without the bur burden of memory and without the anticipation of the future. It's right now. If I ask you, are you aware right now? And you turn to that which is listening while you're listening to me. As you're listening to me, you turn to that which is listening. Then you don't have to worry about what choice you make. It's actually what Krishnamurti called choiceless awareness. In that choiceless awareness is spontaneity. And that spontaneity is highly conscious because it's not burdened by what we would in ordinary language call karma. You know, people have a lot of misunderstanding about karma in general. Karma is just memory. And it's not just memory, it is the interpretation of memory. So we are burdened by the interpretation of past stories which don't exist at the moment. You say, does the past exist? It doesn't, except as a thought. So it interferes with our spontaneity. Conscious living is without anticipation, without regret, in this moment, spontaneously coming from that little gap of silence in between every experience. So in between every experience, it doesn't matter what the experience is. 
And all experience by definition is a sensation. So it's a modified form of consciousness. Breathing is an experience. Thought is an experience. Perception is an experience. But what is the source of the experience is silent. So if you go back to that source, you don't, you have what, I think the term choiceless awareness or the highest intelligence being the ability to observe yourself without judging yourself gives you spontaneity. That's conscious living. It leads to all those things we talked about, Ichha Shakti, Ananda Shakti, Kriya Shakti. From Kashmir and various others. Uh, and a question that emerges from this uh, is that if there's a model of reality which our intelligence kind of forces us into, what are the steps that one has to take to experience true reality? It almost seems like uh, intelligence will help you, but only up to a point. And then you need to surrender it. Uh, how does one do that? It seems like jumping without a safety net. Yes, beautiful question. So, you know, I quoted chapter 13, uh, Krishna, Sankhya, but Sankhya, uh, there are other elaborations of that, and there are at least 24 modes of knowing in Sankhya. So the first mode of knowing is the mind, then the second is the intellect, then is the ego. Then it progresses from there, you know, all the modes of knowing, it does several years, 24 modes of knowing. And those modes of knowing are all modified forms of consciousness. So how do we experience reality? And the simplest way is yoga, if you understand yoga. And of course, we have Gyan Yoga, Chak, you know, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti yoga. Uh, but uh, let's stick with one, mm -hmm. and that is uh, Raj Yoga, mm -hmm. so, as described by Patanjali. So Patanjali describes eight steps to reality. I mean, you know, he starts off very simply. Yeah. First chapter, second verse. Yog Chit Vritti Nirod. That's it. But how do you get there? Okay. Yog, everybody knows what Vrittis are. Vrittis are sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, fluctuations of consciousness that we use to create models of reality. Okay. So when the Vrittis die down, then you have experienced reality, which is infinite and the source of every experience and the source of every model as well. Uh, every model, whether it's a scientific model or a spiritual model or whatever model you want to use. But how do you get there? Patanjali says eight steps. Okay, so Yama is actually, if you really understand Yama, and he's very smart in the sequence in which he uh, gives us this knowledge. So Yama is, in modern language, we would say social intelligence. Okay. okay? Niyama, in modern language, is emotional intelligence, your relationship with yourself. In modern language, you can use the Sanskrit, which is beautiful, by the way, and modern language doesn't do justice. As limitations. As limitations. But Yamas and Niyamas, as described by Patanjali, are the first step. Because if you don't know how to engage with other people, and you don't know your relationship with yourself, you, you're off to the, the wrong start to begin with. Then Patanjali does something very simple and very smart. He jumps from yama and yama straight to asana. Why? Because everybody understands this body or thinks they understand it. But everybody also un thinks that the body is a physical entity, which is it, it's naive realism. The body is a field of awareness. You know, Kashmir Shaivism, meditate on your body as the universe and having the nature of awareness. So your body is actually the kshetra, kshetra. Okay, and so every asana is actually a modified form of consciousness. Your body is consciousness. Okay perceived as a physical object, naive realism. So asana is, that's why asana is so popular. People go, oh, they want to look good, they want to lose weight, they want to stop smoking. 
but when they come out, they are intoxicated. And that's why, you know, yoga is intoxicating, even the asana. It's not exercise. It's, you know, in modern terms, it's parasympathetic nervous system, vagal stimulation, all of that. Forget all of that. But through asana, you have the opportunity of understanding the kshetra. And this kshetra is one with the kshetra that we call the universe. Because how do we experience the universe? Through vrittis. There's no other way of experiencing the universe other than through vrittis. So what we're doing is understanding through asana, this and the universe as an entangled experience in consciousness. Third step. Then Patanjali immediately moves to pranayam. Now he's getting subtler. Okay, so what he says is, if you go to pranayam, that's the interface between consciousness and biology. Okay, and now you can use that interface to modulate... The tool with which you control. Modulate. Control the body. Right. So now he's moved to a more subtle place. And then he moves even more subtler to what he calls pratyahara, which is normally translated as withdrawal of the senses, which is a good thing, but actually it's more than withdrawal of the senses. It is what we call interoceptive awareness. So there's perception, which is looking at the so-called outside world, which is also an illusion, but never mind. So perception is the outside world. Interoception is knowing what's happening inside. Now we all practice interoceptive awareness. We learned it as babies. We call it toilet training. Okay, you learned how to control your bladder and your bowels. But the yogi said, why did you stop there? Why don't you control your heart rate? Why don't you control your immune system? I'm using modern terms. But why don't you learn to self-regulate your entire body? Okay, so right now, let's try this. Uh, just close your eyes for a second and become aware of your heart. Be aware of your heartbeat right now, if you can. Just all you have to do is bring awareness there and a little stillness. And you should be able to feel your heartbeat or some sensation, some throbbing, some sensation, something. Now open your hands and just have the intention to feel your heartbeat in your hands. And you should be able to feel something. Some tingling, some throbbing, something. Now move your awareness back to your heart. Go back and forth. And now bring your awareness to your entire body. Abdomen, chest. Just have the idea that that same heartbeat, that same pulsing, is happening everywhere in every cell in your body. And you can then direct that pulsing to any organ in your body and eavesdrop on it. <coughs> Please open your eyes. So, you know, I just gave you a very brief glimpse of Pratyahara, but how many people felt their heartbeat here? Okay. And you could go back and forth, right? Now, with a little practice, you can do that with all the cells of your body in direct awareness, and awareness is self-regulating. So the yogi who's adept at pratyahara can not only regulate their heartbeat, their body temperature, can cool it, warm it. Of course, pranayam can do that too. But there is nothing in your body that the yogi, yogic practice of pratyahara cannot help you do. Okay. Now we've come to the five preparatory steps. These are just preparation. Because the last three steps are dharana, dhyan, samadhi. Dharana is this what we just did, using pratyahara, directing awareness. Dhyan is the actual practice of meditation, mantra practice or whatever. And then samadhi is when subject-object split disappears. And now you have reality. The last step. That's reality. That's infinite. It's formless. You know, 
Rabindranath Tagore had a beautiful poem where he said, in this playhouse of infinite forms, I caught sight of the formless. And then my life was blessed. Only the formless is real. If you're not intimate with the formless, the invisible that is you, then the visible will just be a human construct. Can we say, this is one of the things I had... Uh, sorry, may I really request that people could put their phones on silent please? Uh, uh, one of the things that... And there are two kind of contradictory thoughts emerges from uh, something I learned from my grandfather, who, as you know, was a pundit, uh, who was a priest in uh, Kashi. Yes, yes. So, uh, he told me that actually many of us don't realize the greatest tool that we have conscious control of is our body. Absolutely. And we are wasting so much time trying to create other tools and ignoring this. And we can actually experience everything with this. But this is, in a way, a little, little bit in contradiction to what's there in the Brihadaran Upanishad, which you would have heard, neti neti, not this, not this, not this, not this, you know, which then went into the formless. How does one marry the two while still using this as a tool? Neti neti is a concept which says that it's it's a way to get into the formless. Which not I this, quoted this, in the beginning. This, if yeah. you can see yeah. it, touch yeah. it, yeah. taste it's it, not I, real. it's not But real. then there's a tool. So then, isn't that a bit in contradiction? It's a complementarity. Everything that we call a contradiction or a paradox is a complementarity in that it makes experience possible. Okay, so the mind-brain, what modern science calls the mind-brain problem, and there's no problem. The brain and mind are complementary activities of consciousness. Okay, so the visible and the invisible are complementary activities of a fundamental reality which is incomprehensible. That's why the last, last niyama mm. is Ishwar Pranidhana. Mm. You <laughs> surrender to it, okay? Because your mind will reel with bewilderment if you try to access it through a system of thought. You cannot access it. Even the system of thought that we call Vedanta, you cannot capture it, okay? Because it's a system of thought. Vedanta directs you there, okay? But fundamental reality is infinite, incomprehensible, irreducible, unimaginable, non-conceptualizing, non-conceptualizable. That's why Ishwar Pranadhana. And there's no contradiction. Everything that we call contradiction or paradox makes experience possible. How can you have an up without a down? How can you have birth without death or death without birth? You know, people normally think life is the opposite of death. No. Life is the continuum of birth and death. Birth and death are complementarities. Okay, it's just like up and down are complementarities or hot and cold are complementarities or the visible and the invisible are complementarities. So neti neti is Nothing and everything simultaneously. Every time one speaks to him, the mind just goes a level higher. <laughs> um, Deepak, there are some questions that uh, you know that Rizika wanted to ask as well. Uh, Rizika, if you want to come up and then post that, we'll of course open it for a uh, for a few questions. Sure. Deepak has kindly offered to stay. Uh, slightly longer than uh, the, the time that we had budgeted, but we have to ensure that we don't misuse his hospitality, so we are going to keep that uh, as uh, controllable as we can. But first, Vidika, uh, is there a mic? Just give the mic over. You know, people in the hostel, can't hear you because of the echo. Oh. So Alright, okay, apologies for that. What we can do is refer them to the live stream later. We will be putting up a live stream also. Soon. Yeah. But let's correct that if possible. And there are some cases here. Sorry, just give us a sec. Yeah. I'll tell you what, use this in the meantime. There you go. Thank you 
for that very beautiful conversation. I think it doesn't happen every day that we have amongst us uh, a visionary thinker like Dr. Deepak Chopra speaking to someone like Amish Tripathi, both of them uh, really authorities in their own field and in an understanding of uh, you know ancient wisdom. Um, uh, and I think the conversation that we now want to have with the both of them is you know how do we harness this power of uh, ancient wisdom in the age of AI? Uh, Dr. Chopra said something very beautiful, which is that you know uh, whenever you see a paradox or a contradiction, it's a little bit of a complementarity. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, you know the two themes that seems to be emerging in the world today is uh, you know uh, people wanting to harness the power of spirituality in a world of technology. So we have spirituality and technology. Uh, you know, whether they are contradictions or complementarities, Dr. Chopra will tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, but uh, Dr. Chopra, you wrote a book in the June of 1993, which is now exactly uh, 20 years back on uh, ageless uh, body, timeless mind. Can you tell us a little bit more in this age of AI? Uh, can AI really help us harness, uh, you know, uh, the power to achieve an ageless body and timeless mind? Short answer is yes. Uh, short answer is yes. But then let's see what we mean by the word ageless body and timeless mind. Okay, so what is your body, number one? And if I ask people what is your body, they say this, right? But this air is your breath. The trees are your lungs. If they didn't breathe, you wouldn't breathe. The rivers and waters are your circulation. The earth is recycling as your body right now. And the atoms in your body, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, 96% are just that, those. And the remaining 4%, iron, calcium, whatever, they were made in the crucible of burning stars. 50% of the atoms in your body are from the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we are told now that there are two trillion galaxies. So multiply two trillion galaxies, and 50% of the atoms in your body came from outside the Milky Way galaxy, according to some science right now. So right this moment, through a phenomenon called gravitational wind. So you say, this is my body. Well, no. This is, all this is my body. The stars, the galaxies, the all forms of life, 99% of your genetic information is bacterial. Okay. So what is your body? If you say this, you're limited. If you say aham brahmasmi, you're not limited. <laughs> so you're, when you understand what your body is, you realize it doesn't even exist in time. Right? This, where is this experience happening right now? We proved that it's not happening here, it's not happening here. It's happening in infinite consciousness right now, which is timeless. So if you understand truly what your body is, it is already ageless and it is already timeless and birth and death are human constructs for the starting and subsiding of vrittis. That's all it is. Take away the vrittis and you are already ageless and timeless. Now, having said that with AI and all these technologies, we should get close to what is a health span, a lifespan, which is lived which does mean there's no so-called physical death, because death makes life possible. Without death, there's no birth. Without birth, there's no death. So if we had no death as we normally construct it in our imagination, then we would all be doomed to eternal senility. So <laughs> death is a, makes life possible, but having said that, Pay a little attention to what the great rishis said. Okay? They said, you should not die of disease, number one. 
Now we know today that actually less than 5% of disease is due to what we call genetic predeterminant determinism, which means there are 5% of genes that are fully penetrant which guarantee disease. Now AI will help there because we will have gene editing soon. You'll be able to cut and paste genes the same way as you cut and paste your email. Okay, read the barcode of a gene, delete the effect, defective gene, insert the right gene. What are genes though? Now, if not, forget modern science for the moment, but genes are the experiences of our ancestors. And they're alive in your body right now. You can't move your hands unless that genetic activity of your ancestors was not here right now. So your ancestors are here right now. But 5% of disease or less is determined. The rest is what we call epigenetic, which means the conscious living part of it. Now, if we do that, conscious living, and we have gene editing, then you should be able to live technically as long as you want and die in samadhi by choice. Been there, done that. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, that's fantastic. Yes. Yes. Thank you. There's a, there's a lovely line of Socrates that death may be the greatest of all human blessings. Absolutely <laughs> true. You know, I think Socrates, Plato, all these people were influenced by Vedanta yeah. uh, due to Alexander the Great's yes. invasion, you know. Uh, on that thought, uh, Dr. Chopra, you know, uh, like you said, a lot of the great philosophers uh, in history were uh, influenced by Vedanta. Uh, you've written a fantastic book recently. Anyone who's not had a chance to read it, uh, Living in the Light, Yoga uh, for Self-Realization. Uh, this week was also the International uh, uh, Day of Yoga. We had wonderful celebrations at the High Commission uh, here and at the Nehru Center. How do we harness these ancient sciences such as yoga, Ayurveda, uh, Vedanta in the age of AI, are they really still relevant or it's time to kind of just forget and move forward? If we understand Advait, see there are three schools of thought right now in science on the nature of reality. So one school is matter only and matter produces everything. That's obviously not true because we cannot even explain how matter would produce a thought or a longing or an inspiration or self-awareness. So cut that out. The second is what Descartes gave to the world, dualism. Nice settlement between the scientific community and the Pope. Okay, you take care of spirituality, Mr. Pope. We'll take care of the material world. <laughs> it doesn't work. You can't even explain how do you raise your hand. This starts with a thought and this is a physical thing. And it violates the laws of thermodynamics anyway. So dualism is out. So the only thing that's left is conscious only, consciousness only, Advait. So what is this? It's a modified form of consciousness. What is this? Modified form of consciousness. What is this? As a perceptual activity, these are all modified forms of consciousness. When you see yourself in this, it's called beauty. When you see yourself in another person, it's called love. And the combination of all that is called satyam, shivam, sundaram. Okay? So, so what is AI? It's a modified form of the same consciousness that has created language. That has, you know, it's one of the biggest problems in science. What's the biological basis of consciousness? If you ask a wrong question, you'll never get the right answer. There's no biological basis of consciousness because biology is an experience in consciousness. Without consciousness, there's no experience of biology. So, you know, therefore, there's no contradiction at all. AI will help us understand the evolution of language, will help us understand how we self-regulate, and ultimately, there is nothing other than consciousness. If you just take that one rule of Advait, 
Okay. One rule of Advait. You asked this question earlier. Yatha pinde, tatha brahmande. As is the body, as is the atom, so is the universe. As is the human body, so is the cosmic body. As is the human mind, the cosmic mind, the cosmic intellect, the cosmic, you know, when we say mano buddhi ahankar, we are the limited aspects of a mano buddhi ahankar, which is incomprehensible and infinite. So AI will be a gift. Properly used. Properly used. Properly used. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very heartening to know. I think every now and then we hear about the dangers of AI and the world keeps uh, wondering when, we, you know, are we going to face extinction with AI taking over? So, so the, the, those, those are legitimate concerns. And if extinction happens, it will be because Consciousness decided that. Okay? Advait, stick to Advait. <laughs> you know, consciousness is the creator, destroyer, yes. and sustainer, so there's no contradiction there either. Um, you know, like I said, we have, we have two wonderful visionary thinkers with us, uh, Amish, because we have the pleasure of you here also with Dr. Chopra. By the way, I'm a big fan of Amish. I have read his works, <laughs> and I, I think... He's an extraordinary gift to the world from India. Uh, uh, oh, wow. That is <laughs> no, no. no, I mean it. You just, you just made my year and my life. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I have read your work, and I think it's extraordinary. Uh, you have done a great service by taking these ancient myths and giving them relevance in modern times. Uh, Amish has written some wonderful books, uh, which I'm sure many of you have read, just as Dr. Chopra said, uh, you know, where he brings ancient myths to life, right? Uh, so Amish, what do you think, you know, from your knowledge and understanding of these ancient myths and epics, uh, uh, what lessons can we draw from them to really navigate the ethical dilemmas that face the world in this age of AI? I think a key thing that strikes me and Really saying this in the presence of Dr. Chopra might be uh, wrong, uh, but if I can just, a thing that strikes me uh, is uh, the importance of, uh, there's this lovely uh, Indian concept called Viveka, uh, which is the ability to distinguish yourself uh, and make your own choices. We are used to this uh, paradigm over the last many centuries that someone will make a simple set of laws and all we have to do is follow that and not use our own mind and not make our own choices and then everything will be okay. Uh, when the real world is actually far, far, far more complicated if one wants to evolve. Um, and I think uh, what one learns from Deepak Chopra and his books and you know you've influenced me deeply uh, for, for many years, for decades actually, um, is the entire point of evolution is to learn how to use our own mind, to make our own choices. Not that uh, God will come and tell us what to do. One of the things I really like in the Indian uh, way is that even the gods are subject to the law of cause and effect, uh, to the laws of uh, karma and dharma. Uh, and all of us have to learn to evolve, learn to, uh, to see the stories, see what's happening, evolve, make up our own mind so that we can live consciously, so that we can become, uh, you know, get moksha and become part of the divine. And for me, that truly is the real journey. Don't get lost in trying to find someone who will give you solutions, who will give you, follow these ten laws and everything will be okay. Uh, because the universe doesn't work that way. All of us have our own individual journey and we have to walk it ourselves. Uh, and that's why that Viveka concept in my mind, is one of the most critical uh, concepts in our, in our ancient way. I think Nothing what uh, Amish has done very successfully uh, with the myths is make them relevant to our current world. If you look at the word myth, it's actually related to the word maya, also related to mata, matrika, Man, human, woman. So what is myth? Myth is our highest instinct to understand the infinite or what we call God. 
Okay. These days in a secular society, infinite is easier than God because God everybody fights about, right? All the wars are about God. <laughs> <laughs> so myth is our highest. It's also, by the way, etymologically, myth is not literally mata, matrika. It's the mother.